And welcome back. The Bronx Defenders isn't your typical not-for-profit public defender. It's a catalyst for change, reshaping how people interact with the justice system. With a focus on tackling systemic problems, they lead efforts ranging from bail reform to addressing unconstitutional practices. Here now, the legal director for the criminal defense practice at the Bronx Defenders, Ilona Coleman. And Ilona, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me, Darren. I really appreciate it. I look forward to talking with you. Oh, look forward to the conversation. And let's make our viewers a little bit more acquainted. So when we talk about uh, the work that you're doing, what kind of cases are you handling? Sure. So uh, as you mentioned, I'm the legal director for the criminal defense practice. And in that role, I handle a variety of cases, uh, really with, you know, we have a holistic bent at the Bronx Defenders. So I handle individual cases, anything from misdemeanors to uh, homicide cases. And then I also train everyone, make sure they're updated on the law. I handle all of the appeals uh, at the Bronx Defenders. And then I also uh, draft and participate in any amicus briefing. So I have a variety of responsibilities at the Bronx Defenders um, in addition to my own client work. You use the word amicus briefing. I'm a little familiar, but make our viewers more familiar. What's an amicus briefing? Absolutely. So amicus means friend of the court. And that means that sometimes we won't have an individual who has been directly impacted by something that's happened in a court case, but we may have other clients who could be impacted by something that's going to happen in a court case. And so sometimes we will reach out to the court really as a friend of the court and offer our opinion uh, about the legal issue and how that could impact some of our clients down the road if the law were to go one way or the other. Uh, so we, you know, again, our clients aren't directly impacted by the issue. Uh, they're not a defendant or a plaintiff in the lawsuit, but we're essentially providing some guidance to the court on how this could impact our clients. And so we've filed many, many amicus briefs, sometimes even up to the US Supreme Court, um, in addition to uh, the local appellate courts here in New York State. Alona, you talked a little bit about uh, the work that you do with appeals. How prevalent are we seeing appeals in courts today? So very prevalent, that's a great question. Uh, we handle, in our office, we handle any appeal where the government's actually taking the appeal and it impacts one of our clients. So um, we handle at least four appeals a year. Um, and those are just for uh, cases where the government's taking an appeal uh, and it directly impacts our clients or something that um, has happened either at the appellate level and then that's gonna go up to the court of appeals. So we do handle many, many appeals. So in addition to the trial level work that I handle, I also handle appellate level work. What do you think by way of the court system? We were having this conversation uh, a couple of times on this platform, really dealing with where we are as far as court, uh, you know, court calendars, uh, knowing coming out of COVID, the challenges that were out there. Uh, are things still pretty jammed up? They are, and you know, I know that when we, you know, when we had this, you know, the pandemic, right? There were these systems that were put into place, like virtual court appearances, um, and that happened in criminal court and supreme criminal here in the Bronx. And you know, the thinking about it at first, you know, we, you know, we weren't really sure. The lawyers weren't sure if this was best for the client. Um, of course, we wanted to keep the client safe. We wanted to keep ourselves safe. Uh, and so virtual appearances were allowing that to happen. You know, but one of the concerns that we had as a public defender that I had in particular with virtual appearances was really that I was worried that the judge wouldn't see our client, you know, for everything that they are, right? The whole person that you know, what was really gonna happen was that the judge was gonna see our client through a screen and be making decisions about you know, their liberty, uh, whether or not they were going to be incarcerated uh, you know, in, on bail at Rikers Island. And so I think there was a real concern about that. 
What I will say now that we've sort of seen how this has played out is that I think using virtual appearances is extremely handy. It, it allows for things to move quicker in court. What you'll see in criminal court, at least, and sometimes in Supreme, but for a large, uh, a large part in criminal court, we have a lot of court congestion. We have a lot of cases. You know, things have sort of come back almost to pre-pandemic levels where uh, people are unfortunately sitting around in court all day waiting for their case to be called. And I think virtual appearances could actually relieve a lot of that. And you know what? The court system has the technology to do it. Yeah. Um, in talking to people about taking the virtual route, what kind of response are you getting from your clients when we uh, talk about possibly going the virtual route? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. I mean, you know, you you know that I represent poor people, right? And not everyone has, if you're poor, you don't necessarily have access to wireless, right? You don't have access to a cell phone. So sometimes that can be problematic. And certainly when we were in virtual, the virtual appearance world back during COVID times, the height of COVID, you know, I had clients who uh, found it difficult to actually log on or to get the software they needed to be able to access the appearance. Um, but I will say that for a majority of my clients, uh, they found virtual appearances to be quite helpful, right? I would have clients who could go to work, they would call in for their virtual appearance, the appearance would last, you know, 15, 20 minutes at most. And then they could get back to their lives, right? Because a majority of the calendar calls or a majority of the cases, excuse me, that are being heard in criminal court are really calendar calls, right? Where they're very, very quick appearances uh, determining whether or not the prosecution has provided discovery to defense, if defense and prosecution have filed motions on the cases. So not much is really of substance really happening. And virtual appearances, I think, really allowed many of my clients to, you know, sort of move through their lives without much disruption. So I'm really in favor where we can do it. Um, and people have the ability to get onto Wi-Fi to actually have virtual appearances. Alona, you spoke a little bit about the, cl uh, the clients that you serve, predominantly coming out of, you know, uh, poor and economically challenged neighborhoods. Uh, as you look at the criminal justice system right now, and we know uh, that it has not strongly favored uh, poor and particularly people of color, uh, what are we seeing by way of improvement that you can say, hey, I'm looking here and I'm saying things have changed for the better here? Yeah, no, I think I think it's a work in, in progress, right? I mean, I, I think that we have seen some real reforms, which have been extremely beneficial to my clients, um, including bail and discovery reforms. So in 2020, uh, the legislature implemented these, really these sweeping reforms to both bail and discovery. And so now with respect to bail, less of my clients are being held in on bail uh, where they've, you know, accused of committing very low level type crimes. Um, and so I think that has been extremely beneficial. And discovery reform has also been beneficial because we're now getting, as a defense attorney, I'm now getting the information sooner and quicker. I can talk with my client about what the evidence is, and we can make a determination how to actually handle the case much quicker than I was able to pre-discovery reform. So those types of reforms uh, have been extremely beneficial to my client. But again, this is a work in progress. The, the criminal justice system is not perfect. As, you, as we all recognize, um, there are some real problems. And um, I think some of the changes are certainly helping that, but we have a, a long way to go. Yeah, certainly not to put you on the spot. I mean, I think it speaks for itself. So, uh, but to see, you know, where we are today, and obviously in 2024, uh, knowing that there's a huge calendar, a lot of things to contend with. Um, but let me back up for a moment and just go here and talk a little bit about uh, the work that's being done, because 
a lot of work that you've do, you're doing is is somewhat groundbreaking in some ways, and in other ways, it's really um, making a difference in the lives of, of your clients. So, share with me a little bit about that community impact um, that you guys have been able to uh, bring about. Yeah, no, thank you so much for asking that question because I'm, you know, something that uh, we I've recently been working on, and I'm I'm really proud of the work that we've been doing. Uh, concerns this mass surveillance lawsuit uh, that we filed actually last month in April. Um, and so uh, let me just, you know, let me give you a little bit of background, which is that, uh, and this lawsuit was filed against the Department of Correction. So the Department of Correction records and monitors nearly every call made by people in custody. And they do this through their contract with a for-profit private firm called Securus Technologies. And the, the system monitors and records everything, right? And they don't only record and collect the substance of those calls, but they're collecting um, the personal and biometric information of incarcerated New Yorkers, uh, primarily many of whom are black and brown New Yorkers because they're housed at Rikers Island while they're awaiting trial. And it's also surveilling community members, loved ones, friends, clergy, anyone who calls or speaks with an incarcerated person in a DOC facility. And in reality, what this is, is that DOC through Securus is operating a mass community surveillance project. And the universal recording subjects, you know, incarcerated people and their loved ones to increased government monitoring, data collection, and scrutiny in violation of constitutional and privacy rights under both the federal and state laws. And so last month, our office, along with the Brooklyn Defender Services, New York County Defender Services, and Cleary Gottlieb, filed a class action on behalf of individuals who are both incarcerated and community members. Uh, and we brought that action here in Bronx County in Supreme Court uh, against the New York City Department of Correction over this mass surveillance, um, really, and mass incarceration of New Yorkers. Um, so, you know, we're very excited about that lawsuit. And at this point, the Department of Correction will have to respond to that suit, uh, and we will go through the civil discovery process. It took a while to get there, but uh, are you optimistic that you'll be able to uh, see this all the way through? You know, I, I am optimistic that there's going to be a change. Um, I'm certainly uh, optimistic that the Department of Correction is going to have to do something. I think the city is going to have to do something, in particular with respect to our contract with Securus Technologies. I will just note that Securus Technologies has been sued throughout the country for their violations of privacy and mass surveillance of people. And so I think there's going to be a real reckoning um, with respect to our contract with this uh, this this private uh, firm, Securus Technologies. Yeah, a lot to pay attention to. Certainly, we'll continue to, uh, you know, we'll continue to follow that. Uh, anything else in terms of uh, legislation and things that we should be paying attention to out of your office and work that you're doing? Well, you know, there there is some legislation that is coming about. Um, unfortunately, I'm not the, the person to sort of talk about it. It does relate to this mass surveillance. Um, so you should sort of stay tuned. I'm hoping that folks will certainly follow us on social media, follow us, uh, you know, on our website and get more information about our litigation efforts in addition to uh, this new legislation that should be coming out uh, in the next couple of weeks. For somebody who's out there right now and uh, saying, listen, I may need a criminal defense attorney. Um, there's probably some quick tips that you could give them in terms of advice and things to do uh, right away. What would those things be? Sorry, Darren, you just cut out for the for a very short time, so sure. I, I only heard. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat again. I said, well, there may be somebody out there that's watching, right, saying, listen, I do need a criminal defense attorney. Um, and I said, 
what kind of tips would you give them right off the start uh, to get themselves on the right path to getting a proper defense? Sure. I think it, you know, my recommendation is that whenever an individual is approached by law enforcement or they think law enforcement is looking for them, they should absolutely call our office and, um, you know, or call me. My information is certainly available on our website um, because I think getting out in front of sort of the the case is really important, right? Having a conversation with that person to understand why law enforcement might want to speak to them, whether or not they're a suspect or a witness in a case. And so we're always happy to engage with anyone who reaches out to our office. We can get them an attorney, you know, assigned to them, and we can talk with them about how to best protect themselves um, if they think that they are going to be um, prosecuted. Yeah. So if people want more information, what do they do? So they can reach out to our front desk, our receptionist. Um, they can talk to our early defense team. It's really just about making a phone call to our office um, or sending an email to me as the legal director. They can certainly reach out that way and I can put them on the right path. That's certainly not a problem and I, I love to do it. Well, Alona Coleman, thank you so much for being with us. She is the legal director for the criminal defense practice at the Bronx Defenders. It's been great talking to you. Got to have you back. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Darren. Take care. All righty. Taking a quick break. And guess what? We'll be with more right after this.